You guys are rocking it, by the way. We're like, I don't know if I want to leave yet. What's going on over there? Anyway, we're really glad that you're here today. So welcome to Forward City. If this is your first time here or your first time in a long time, we're really stoked that you guys are here. And um, we just counted a blessing. And if, again, if you're new to us, if you're new with us, just to, oh, they saw the girl and they're like, let's go that way with that girl. No, you got to go that way. Sorry. That's, uh, that's life at its best right there. Where's she going? I want to go with her. Watch him, just he's dejected. He's completely dejected. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if you saw that. That was actually pretty real. It was pretty exciting. Um, so, yes, my name is Mark, and I'm uh, on leadership here. I'm one of the pastors here at Forward City Church, and we're just really glad that you're here with us today. And I know a lot of people maybe are new, or maybe it's been a long time. Um, just to remind you, we're here to help you move forward towards a full life in Christ. Um, we love relationships. We love connecting, and um, that's allowing us to meet outdoors. It's allowing us to connect in this context where um, if we met indoors, we wouldn't be able to have the kids doing their things. We wouldn't be able to do that. So uh, we're choosing to meet outside right now. And until the Lord opens up those opportunities, we're going to leverage this. And we want to encourage you that uh, th this strange time period has caused many of us to, as soon as we're done, okay, just to leave. I mean, we, we encourage you to, to stay and at your comfort level and to connect because really that's how God intended us to be, to connect to be in a family, to be in a relationship. God calls us a body, and we're all interconnected, and we all have different parts and different, different, different parts we play in this beautiful story of God's church, um, but we're kind of all part of a family, so let's enjoy that. And again, if you're here today, maybe you're here because someone drug you here. Maybe you pro you're promised to meet a pretty girl. I don't know your story. Maybe you're here today, and you're still trying to figure this whole Jesus thing out. Um, this message today is actually really, really geared towards you, not just people who kind of go to church on a regular basis because there's some real application here that I really think it can really um, steer into your life and help you to ask, to answer a question that maybe you've been asking for a long time in your own life. And so the questions that we just really want to ask here is just, have you ever wondered why something succeeds and others don't? Okay, have you ever wondered why, um, why, why something that, that should work? So it, it makes so much sense. You see it has so much potential, so much opportunity. Like this should be, this is no brainer. This should absolutely make sense. But then at other times we see things that fail so spectacularly. Like it makes complete sense, but it doesn't seem to work out. And so when I was thinking about this and writing this, I remember Target coming to Canada. Does anybody remember that? Anyone? How many, how many of you are still kind of a little bit disappointed in that whole process that you see Target coming? Now, if you're from the States, um, yeah, you just Target's always been there. But when Target tried to come across to Canada, it was this incredibly exciting thing that many people were really stoked about. But um, it was a huge debacle. Like it, it crashed and burned like nobody's business. And a lot of people sit back and some, you know, we're listening to some podcasts about this. And um, a lot of people kind of settle on the fact the reason why it failed so severely and so, so drastically was because of two main missteps. And number one, that Target didn't understand the, 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 uh, the Canadian shopping experience. It, for whatever reason, it, it wasn't able to, to say, here's what it is in the States, here's what it's going to be in Canada. And they also would say that it was because they didn't understand the Canadian market because we're so vast and so different here in Canada. They didn't understand us. But really, when you look at it um, and you listen to people who really understand this stuff, that's not the reason why it failed. I mean, for all intents and purposes, this should have been a no-brainer. This should have been something that was like absolutely fantastic. But when you talk to people and you listen to some of the strategy and the reasons behind it, it wasn't because of those two things. See, when Target was coming into Canada, um, it, it chose the strategy to open really big and to open really fast. And so what they wanted to do is like a shock and awe, just hit everywhere, not just some small spots, but hit everywhere. And about that time, there were a whole bunch of Zeller's leases that came up for uh, opportunity. So they just needed real estate. If we're going to open really big and we're going to open really fast, we need real estate. We don't want to build buildings. We want to get established realtor or established places. And so Zeller's was opening up because Zeller's failed. And so 220 Zeller's leases came available in 2011. And they kind of saw Walmart sniffing around. It's like, no, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get into this. We're going to latch on to this really quick. So they made a quick decision to purchase 180 of those leases for $1.8 billion. Now, again, just hold on. I'll explain why this matters in a second. 
See, with the problem of real estate solved, they decided, okay, so we have this thing now. Now we have this incredible task to open 124 stores, and we're going to do it really fast. We're going to do it within two years. And with that declaration, the clock started to tick. And then Target had to go out and they had to do the enormous undertaking of of employing 17,000 people. And they had to employ all these people and they had to train all these people. But because the deadline was so short, they didn't have a lot of time to teach and to train their people. Their normally amazing training system that takes months and months, they only really allotted for two weeks of this place or for these people to be trained. And because of that, um, they are all like, okay, you know, we're going to train these employees. And like, well, you know, we're also going to build new distribution centers. So rather than using existing distribution centers, they wanted to build brand new ones. And normally one distribution center being built would take a few years. They chose to build three within two years. And Target finally decided that because their logistics didn't work very well, uh, the U.S. wasn't set up for foreign currency. It wasn't set up for, uh, for the Canadian dollar. It wasn't set up for a metric system. It wasn't set up for the French language, language requirements. So they decided to go with a brand new software. Instead of using what they already had and adapting it, it's going to be easier and quicker to go with the brand new software. And it was best in class. But the problem is that software was very difficult to use and is very unforgiving. And Sobeys had tried to use the software to kind of adapt to this brand new software logistics, but they just realized this is way too difficult for us, so they abandoned it. Loblaws actually started to transition to this brand new software, and they projected a three to five year timeline, and it actually took two years longer than expected. But Target was like, no, we can make this work within less than a year. And so due to this like incredibly crunch of the timeline, Um, The staff was very, very little trained. They were well-intentioned but ill-experienced. They tried to input all of the the products, over 75,000 different products into this brand new system that even the U.S. didn't fully understand, that wasn't fully developed for them yet. But they wanted to go. There's this timeline. We got to get there. We got to do this. They decided that we're going to input this and we're going to get it started. 75,000 different products with over 80 fields of information for each one of them, which resulted in thousands and thousands of errors. And when those errors hit the system, massive things started to happen. Items weren't uh, coming from overseas, they were stalled. Tariff codes were missing. Uh, Products weren't fitting into the right shipping containers. The worst part is that the merchandise was piling up in distribution centers, so that actually caused Target to have to rent more and more space while the shelves were empty. And the incorrect data meant that the merchandise couldn't proceed from the distribution centers to the stores. An article from Canadian Business estimated that only 30% of the data that was inputted was actually correct. And meanwhile, the clock kept tipping, ticking and ticking. And so some people sat back and said, you know what, maybe this is too aggressive. Maybe we're trying a little too hard. Maybe we should pull back a little bit on our timeline. But the, but the leaders of the organization said, no, we are not going to pay rent on places that are not opened. And so with all of these problems and all these situations, they said, no, we are going to push forward. We're going to be able to do this. And what turned out to be their biggest mistake was on March 2013, they opened. And many of you were there. You were lined up. And this was like, yes. How many of you were so excited when it opened up? Like some of you were kind of stoked. Some of you guys were maybe too young to understand what Target is. Um, And you haven't been over the States in a long time. So you maybe forgot completely that there's a Target. But when they came, it was huge. But over time, very quickly, they started to realize that it wasn't the shopping experience they would have expected because everything that they wanted wasn't really in stock. Actually, Target would often print flyers that every single thing in the flyer was out of stock. See, it was a logistics nightmare. See, the software um, basically said that it was in stock, but um, the shelves were empty. And see, when Target released its annual report in February, just a year later, it was revealed they had lost $941 million from the launch so far. Two weeks later, the, uh, the, the C- or sorry, three months later, the CEO stepped down. The Canadian president resigned. And then when the new CEO came back to and started to see the numbers and the math and realized, wait, Target, in, under these certain contexts and these certain situations, Target's actually in Canada isn't going to be profitable until this year, 2021. He's like, you know what? We're done. 
See, when you look at the, that whole thing, it wasn't Target failed. And we wonder why. why how, how could something so incredibly lucrative and amazing, and of course it's going to make sense because people go across the border for Target. And so why wouldn't it work here? We have other systems and other things in place that should make sense, that should work. And a lot of people sit back and they're like, you know, it's because they didn't create their American shopping experience. They didn't understand the Canadian consumer. But really, the problem at the end, Target Canada didn't work. Because it was felled by one thing. It was a leasing deal that created an impossible timeline. See, they saw a problem, but they're like, you know, we can do this. We can get through this. This isn't going to affect us. We're target. Like, do you see what we are? Yeah, other people are trying, and it's not working for them, but we're target. It's going to work for us. Of course it's going to work for us. Look at us. Look at the resources we have. Look at everything we have in place. It couldn't fail. And I know this is a business failure thing. I get it. But we've been, we've been walking through this guy named Samson in the Old Testament. And in a lot of ways, in similar ways that this idea of Target, the idea of something so successful, so amazing, so much potential could fail so incredibly drastically and, 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 and famously fail. It really reminds us of the life that Samson lived. And so today, just for a, a few moments, we're going to ask the question is, how does this happen? Like, like how, how does someone go from, from, from greatness to disgrace? How does something go from incredibly awesome to crap? And so in case you're just joining with us, so this is our third week in the series of this sad and frustrating story. And if you've ever read it, you're, and you really read it to understand, you're like, you're frustrated. You're like, Samson, get your mind back in the game. What are you doing? And that's all throughout this passage. And so we, have, we see Samson's story, and, and we know that he was called, if you're new to the story, he's, he was called of God. It was a real person that lived in history. He was called of God, and he was saying, you are going to be set apart for me to do great things, and you're going you're, you're gonna to free the people from um, the oppression of the Philistines. And he was given supernatural strength to accomplish these tasks, and all he had to do was just follow in obedience. He was given incredible potential but the first week we found out that really like, he lived his life and, and, and basically the things that hurt him in, in major ways was that he had lust and, and, and he had entitlement and he had pride. Lust says, I wanted entitlement, says, I deserve it. And pride says, I can handle it. And then we see the downfall from that. The second week we watched as Samson continued to self-destruct because he was, he was so emotionally driven rather than spiritually led. And what that caused him to do was lean into his anger rather than pulling back and say, God, what would you want from me? And today when we pick up this story, Samson is in the desert and it's in, uh, it's in Judges chapter 16. And Samson's in the desert, and he goes through all of these stupid things that he's done, and he's looking, it's, it has a moment of clarity, and he realizes, wait a second, I need God here. I've been doing all of this on my own, and I've been doing it very poorly. Yes, God was using him, but it wasn't blessing him. And he's at this place like, man, I, I need God to kind of set back into this thing. My life has been awful. I need God to kind of repair this. And so it says in this beautiful passage that in this really short moment that, that he turned back to God and God renewed his strength. It says that he uh, drank as the Lord provided for him. And it says that he, was, he returned and he was strengthened and he revived. And then this really cool passage that I have missed so many times as I've read this. I've read these passages multiple times, but I've missed this multiple times. It says this in verse 20 of chapter 16. It says, Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Now, I've missed that, and if we're not careful, we'll miss that. Because we can often look at Samson's story and just see it's like it almost starts at the beginning, and it just like it's this, it's this massive debacle. But really, there was a moment here where Samson got his life right. There was a moment that Samson figured it out. There was a moment here when he received God's grace and God's forgiveness. He goes, I want this not just now, but for the rest of my life. And so it says he lived 20 years and was faithful. So we forget that. We forget. We think that it was just here, here, mistake, 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 mistake. And of course, it's just this huge debacle. But no, it was actually incredible mistakes in his early years. 
And, but that was, a, that was a moment of clarity where he's like, oh, you know what, God, I'm going to change my life around. I'm going to turn everything around. I'm going to live right for God. And so when we pause for a moment, we see here that regardless of his past mistakes, regardless of his sin, Samson received the forgiveness and the refreshing of God. And because of that, he spent 20 years of faithfulness. And this, this sounds a lot like some of you, doesn't it? It sounds a lot like me. Like, you know, how many of you have, a, have history that you would like to, to forget and not ever bring back again? I mean, how many of you have a past that you want to keep in the past? I mean, some of you were like that. Maybe it was when you were a kid, maybe it was a little bit older on. You, you, you have that testimony where it's like, man, I remember, but you know what? God got a hold of my life, and your story's like this one, that God got a hold of my life, and, and it's changed everything. And you're in a space of, of, of health right now. You're, you've turned the corner. You've recovered. You're doing great. You have a healthy family, healthy relationships, and you can, you can resonate with this. Yeah, there was a past, and the best part about your past is that God redeemed it, and God set you straight, and you're now moving forward in grace. What a beautiful story. I love that about God. That you can be a complete screw up. And God's like, no, I'll forgive you. And not only will I forgive you, I will restore you. And not only that, but I'm going to bring you and I'm going to hold you back in this relationship. I'm going to give you opportunity. Some of you are here right now. Some of you get that. Some of you know your past. And they're like, man, I'm glad the past is. but we know the rest of the story. He has a past. He gets redeemed and changed, but we know his story doesn't end there. And this is why this story of Samson is so incredibly important for us because it is so uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable reminder that no matter how good life is right now, no matter how good you're doing, no matter how amazing things are in your life, no matter how awesome you are in your faith and all those things, you are just like Samson, I am just like Samson, that we can just easily fall back into the same old things or brand new problems. See, life can turn if we're not careful because you and I do things that destroy our lives all the time and we're tempted to. And if you read the story, you know that Samson's life takes an incredibly tragic turn because at the end moments of his life, Samson is a heartbroken, weak, disgraced, defeated man who is blind and chained and has become a laughing stock rather than a champion. And just practically, some of you have seen this, haven't you? Like you've seen this. You've seen it in people, and maybe you've seen it in yourself where someone's a really, really strong Christian is like, man, that. And if you had to sit back and think, man, who, who, are the, who, are the, who are the strongest people of faith that you know? Like, you, you would probably name some of these people and be like, man, they're amazing. But if you've been around long enough, you've seen some of those incredible people as pillars have fallen, right? You know, you see people with incredibly godly marriages, beautiful examples of faith, are now broken and divorced separately. You know people who were doing so incredibly well, they were, but now they're living incredibly broken lives. I've seen it. You've seen it. And in those moments, you ask the question that I ask, how does this happen? How does someone have 20 years of great faith after knowing what God has forgiven him of? How does he go back to that? How does someone soaring so high come crashing down so drastically and seemingly so out of the blue? How does someone go from greatness to disgrace? As I'm reading this and understanding this more and more, the answer is that Samson didn't ruin his life all at once. He did it the same way you and I do it. How you and I mess up our lives. He did it one step at a time. It didn't happen all at once, but it happened one step at a time. So when you look at his life and you look at these, like his story, you see that, that one of the reasons or one of the things that, that one of the steps that he was led, and there's multiple ones, but I only have two that we're gonna talk about today. The first one was that instead of living life as a follower of Christ with boundaries, 
Samson left his door open to temptation and sin. See, when you go back and watch what happens in Judges chapter 16, we read that he had 20 good years, but then it says in verse 16, verse 1, it says, then one day. We all have a one day, right? Every time you see someone in their story of their downfall, it, there's one day, one day this happened. But it wasn't just one day. There was something that was going on. But one day we see it actually take place. And he says there, one day he went to the Philistine town of Gaza. Now, the significance of this is that Gaza was the headquarters of the Philistine area. And, and, and so he's going, he's leaving his people where he's leading and growing. And he's going to a place where his people aren't. He's going to the enemy's territory. He's going there. And I don't know why he went there. I, I don't know. I don't, maybe he was going shopping. Maybe he was trying to go to Target. I don't know what was there at the time. But he was going there for a reason that we don't know. But you and me, we sit back and say, dude, what are you doing? Like, I, I don't get it. Like, why would you go there? What are you trying to accomplish? What good is there that's not anywhere else? Remember, this is your enemy, and you're going there? And maybe you thought he could handle it. Hey, I've had 20 good years, man. I've, I've gained all this strength. I've gained, I don't worry about temptation anymore because you know what? I can handle I'm grown up. I'm a big boy now. I got my big boy pants. I can handle this. I don't know his story, but he went there thinking I can do it. And the journey between where he was and where he went is about 25 miles, and he had to walk. And you can imagine that those 25 miles that the Spirit of God was saying, dude, what are you doing? What are you doing? You've had that same, haven't you, when you've been walking towards something you shouldn't be walking towards? You get that thing in your head that says, what are you doing? It's a bad idea. That's wrong. But instead of coming to his senses, he does what a lot of us do. We just keep walking. Step by step. Travels 25 miles. And while he's traveling those 25 miles, he is risking 20 years of faithfulness. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And for a moment, just if you just you know, kind of pull back a little bit and be honest with yourself, how many of you are kind of like that? I mean, you, you're not sinning, but you're leaving the door open. It's not sin. I mean, it's just, I'm not, even, I'm not even sinning. It's nothing wrong with what I'm doing, but you're just kind of walking the line. You're getting close. You're kind of playing with the fire. We do that all the time. I'm stronger. I can handle it. I'm strong, which is interesting because strength doesn't come in when you're proving yourself how close you can get to sin without actually sinning. Strength is actually the ability to say, you know what, I can stand back over here and not get involved. And a lot of you and a lot of people that you know in times in my life, we're just stepping a little too close. We're opening a door that we think we can always close. It's interesting, if you look in your life, you know some of the things that you got involved in. Probably at the beginning, you thought I could handle it. You probably thought it wasn't going to be a big deal. Let's be honest, you know, people who were, who, who were, who were just in horribly broken never thought to themselves, you know what, today, I'm going to ruin my life. Today, I'm going to lose my family, and I'm going to do this right now. So, no, we don't do that. We think, oh, I'm just going to do this. It's not a big deal. It's not going to have any effect on me. So he left the door open. And it says here, it says, one day Samson went to the Philistine, um, oh, sorry, he was surrounded by sin, and then he goes in this place, surrounded by sin, and then what he does, he fails. Duh, right, okay? It says, one day Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. What do you think is going to happen? Hey, I'm going to go where all the problems are, and I'm going to be the one. Okay, yeah, that happens. I get that. People do that in missionary context all the time. I get it. But he didn't go with help. He didn't go with strength. He just went in his own little power. I can handle this. I can do this. You know, it's temptation's not going to bother me. And it says sometime later, you know, he uh, fell in love with a woman named Delilah, which is most of the story that we know. It's a song after her, but it's not really going to brought after her. See, and this is the third time he's messed around with Philistine women. And, this is, and again, th this woman was a Philistine, so she was an enemy of God, but she was also a temple prostitute, which basically means that her job was to have intercourse with people as an act of worship to that particular God. And Samson fell, falls in love with her. 
It all started when he was taking those steps. And when you read about this relationship, you know, we, we, I'm not going to go into the whole story there, but if you read it, you need to read it, man. It is a fascinating and enlightening story. And when you read it, you know this was all a sham. This wasn't a real thing. This wasn't a real relationship. He was maybe in lust or love with her. I don't know. We don't know the story. But we know that she really wasn't because she was kind of like co-opted by the people of the area to find out why Samson was so strong. Hey, we're going to pay you a whole boatload of coin if you just let us know how to stop him. So she's like, hey, Samson. Tell me, your, you know, tell me the secret of your strength. And he lies to her for a little bit. He says it's this, and then he wakes up, and then she did that to him. And uh, you know, he, he, he defeats the enemy, and then there's another time. that three times. He lies to her. We're not told how long this took place, but then it says that she tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. And in verse 17, it says, finally, Samson shared his secret with her. Now, if you've read this story, you've probably read it like me and thought to yourself, Samson, what are you doing there? Why don't you just drop her? Like, I mean, how many of you read that? You're like, why? How? Samson's an idiot. Like, he, what an idiot. You're pointing at him. He's stupid. He got little, he's po you're pointing at Samson. Oh, I would never do that. Which is really kind of funny because we're a lot like Samson. And I know the pushback here. And you're like, man, no, no, I'm not like Samson. Like, I would have said no. I, I, it doesn't take a genius to see that this girl's bad news. I would have, I would have bolted. I would have dropped her like a bag of crap. I, I would have left her. There's no way I would have stuck around. I would never have allowed my life to be destroyed like that. To which I ask the question to the people that say those things. Why do you still look at porn when you know that it has the potential to destroy your intimacy? I would never let anything come into my life to destroy my family and to destroy my relationships. Well, then why do you look at porn? Like, you know, well, why do you still get hammered when you know that it has the potential, the, the overwhelming potential to destroy your family and your kids? I would never do anything to destroy my family, but you still do that. You know, why do you keep buying a whole bunch of stuff knowing that you are already maxed and it's continuing to destroy the surrounding, your, your, your family? Why do you keep doing that? Why do we keep chasing things that are destructive? Why do we keep just, justifying things that we do or don't do by saying, you know, I want it, I deserve it, I can handle it. I know you're not Samson. I know you're not Samson, but I know that we have the same potential to rationalize sin. We have that same potential to rationalize sin, and we do it all the time. It may not be as, as visual and as drastic as Samson's story. I get it, but we do it in small ways and big ways all the time. And in verse 18, we, we see kind of what happens here. Delilah realized, she said, man, well, he's, he told me the truth this time. So she sent to the Philistine rulers. This says, come back one more time, she said, for he's finally told me his secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands, and Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with, her head in, with, with his head in her lap, and she called to a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. If you're wondering what this is all about, read the story. And in this way, she began to bring him down, and it says his strength left him. And it's really cool because in this moment, what did he do, right? I mean, he, he, he didn't mess up his life all at once. It was a step-by-step -step process. And so not only did he allow the door to be open to temptation to sin, this other thing about Samson too is that Samson assumed his disobedience would never cost him. See, Samson didn't think, okay, I'm going to do this and this. And the reason why he stayed is he didn't think it was ever going to cost him anything. He didn't think it was going to affect him. It may affect other people, but it's not going to affect me. Because just like so many of us today, it's like, man, I've gotten away with it before. I've gotten away with it. Why not again? And Delilah called out, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep. And what did he think? He thought, I'm, I'll just do what I've done before. I'll break these chains, I'll break these ropes, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to bust some heads, and I'm going to show who I really am. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. He thought, I can handle it. I'll just, I'll get through it like I always get through it. Yeah, this, 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 this won't affect me. It won't cost me. 
I can leave the door open to sin because I can handle it. And even if it comes, it's not going to cost me anything. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. And in verse 22, it says, And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, where he had gone before, binding him with bronze shackles, and they set him grinding in a prison. And so much God-given potential ends up crashing down one step at a time. So here's the deal. As we kind of I wrap this up, I, just, I, just, I really just want to ask you a question that I have asked myself working through this over the past couple of weeks and months. Um, and it's a hard question that I'm asking you to really be honest with. Where are you stepping away from God? If you're a follower of Christ, for you for a moment is where are you stepping away from God? The brokenness and the, and the, the huge debacle doesn't happen overnight. It happens when we take steps and steps and another step and another step. Samson could have turned back. He could have said, you know what? This is going to lead me in a direction. I'm risking 20 years of faithfulness and grace and, and forgiveness. I'm risking that by step and step and step, by leaving a door open and rationalizing and saying, well, it's not going to affect me. So I say humbly that there may come a time when you have gotten away with it once and you, you're going to get away with it again. No one's found out and no one's really held you accountable, but one day the consequences will show up and say, that's enough. The Bible is super clear and super convicting when it says, be sure your sin's going to find you out. So my question is, where are you stepping? What, what, what are you leaving the door open to? What are you rationalizing by saying, it's not going to affect me? See, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and verses that if you grew up in a church, you know this. This is a really beautiful passage, and this is, this is, this is the glory of the story here in a moment. It says this, but if we confess our sins to him, to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all, from all wickedness. See, here's the beautiful part of the story. I need you to understand this. If you are stepping away from God, here's the beautiful part. You can do something absolutely amazing in the power of God. You don't have to keep going, but instead you can turn around. Just like Samson should have done. He was going and he'd come to a moment of clarity. He said, what am I doing? There is so much blessing that God has given me. There are so many things that God wants me to do. I can't risk this. And if he would have just turned around and went back the other direction, the story could have been much different. For some of you, I don't know your story. I just know mine. That every single one of us are susceptible to being super stupid. And falling from, from the place that God has us and the opportunity that God has us to do for his kingdom and his glory and our families and all these beautiful things that we can do in his power and his strength according to his kingdom. And we're just a couple of steps away from losing an opportunity. I'm not saying that you need to be strong enough. No, we're, we're, we're not strong in this, but we need God to lead us and to guide us. And so I'm telling you right now, what steps, or I'm asking you, what steps are you taking away from God? And then the beautiful thing about that is no matter where you're stepping, no matter where you've landed, God's forgiveness can extend to you. God's grace can extend to you. So I'm challenging you 
turn around. Go the other way because it's not too late. I mean, seriously, that's simple. For some of you, you need to identify some of these things. For some of you, you need to get accountability. You need to speak to someone in your life and say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling here and here. I'm leaving a door open. And I need to help close that door. Here are some things I'm rationalizing. Here are some things that I'm struggling with. We need to be strong enough. We need to be, um, we need, we need to be strong enough to be able to go to someone else and say, hey, I don't want to lose all that God has for me. And I'm strong enough to get the help that I need. I just, I'm just telling you, man, we love you guys. Some of you don't even know you. You're like, how do you love me? You don't even know me. Well, okay, God loves you, and we love God, and so God loves you, so we love you through God. Okay, I get that, right? We want to help you move forward towards a full life in Christ. We want to help you see all the beautiful things that God has for you and for his kingdom. And as we continue to reach Chatham, we continue to reach the surrounding area in Bothwell for the glory of God, as we do those things. I say Bothwell because there's someone here from Bothwell. I heard Bothwell. Okay. We want to see God do great things. Not so we can have this name, not to Ford City. Oh, Ford City. We don't care. We, 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 we want God's name and God's glory to just go all over the city and change lives. But that's not going to happen if you and I just leave the door open for sin. It's not going to happen if you and I just keep rationalizing and just keep walking in a direction that's going to destroy our testimony and the opportunities that God has for us. This isn't about being perfect being perfect because we're not. This isn't about having everything put together and having everything awesome. No, it's not that. It's about being real people with real struggles, turning our hearts back towards a really amazing, forgiving God. So where are you walking? Turn around. If we can help you, if we can be a part of that story, if we can be part of that blessing in your life, man, we are in, absolutely in. Please come talk to us, and we'd love to be able to help encourage you, guide you, uh, be a blessing to you. Uh, we love you, and uh, we're super stoked that you're here today. Um, yeah, so next week, um, come back. Lord willing, it's not going to rain. It's not going to rain, 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 stupid. We've had enough rain, apparently. So um, just want to encourage you that uh, come back next week. We're going to be here, uh, be checking our Facebook page and our, um, our Instagram, all those social media things, so that way you can know, um, you know the details and what's going on. But just know we love you. And I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to send you on your way. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that uh, you've allowed us to see Samson's story. So we can stop pointing fingers at him and look at our own lives in the mirror. Because as much as we don't want to say it, we're a little bit like Samson, given so much incredible potential but also have the potential to destroy our lives because of sin. So God, I know that you've got some plans for us and those plans are gonna be great. Those plans are gonna be amazing. It's not gonna be easy. It's not so that we're gonna be awesome, but it's just that your kingdom can expand and you've got plans for us to be involved in that. Like you wanna build our families, you wanna build our faith, you wanna build our relationships, you wanna build our testimony, and you wanna do great things through all of that. So, Lord, I pray that uh, you would enable us to learn from Samson's life. To not see how close we can get to sin and not do it, but rather see how far away we can get from it. So we're not tempted by it. Or that when we are tempted, we can stand strong. Father, help us not to rationalize wrong. And in those moments of failure, in those moments of sin, that we would turn to you because we know that you will forgive us. Thank you that it's never too late. Thank you that the sin is never too big or too deep for your forgiveness and your love to come into our lives. Thank you for that forgiveness. Put your blessing upon us, God, that we would just, yeah, just move in our days and move in our lives. God, you are so good. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, uh, we're done. Um,